This is a little bit of a rundown on a couple of little issues that we ran into with some various different cars and, you know, Dodge Stratus and whatnot. And I sometimes like to bounce this stuff off the of stuff we run into in here. Before I do that, I want to tell you a little bit of difference about one of the things that you're going to see, this is where heat and air conditioning is going in cars, is R1234. Why else? They got the, require the use of specific AC compressor oils and tools. Their uh, vehicles equipped with 1234 have unique low and high side service fittings and inter 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 internal heat exchangers. Uh, SAE 2842 compliant evaporator cores. Uh, newer device service procedures. And everything is just totally different. Now you've got to have, you might notice on this system here, you've got an extra heat exchanger that goes in the middle and all that, and you know, Daniel may start seeing some of these at the dealership, or he may have already seen them, but anyway, these are, this refrigerant costs $100 a pound right now. It's expensive. Uh, what they were concerned about is the, you know, quote-unquote global warming potential of R134A. You know, we can't really have, for some strange reason, an affordable refrigerant, you know, that doesn't cost an arm and a leg. We've got to figure out a way to make it cost $100 a pound so that it's really aggravating for everybody to have to deal with. Right. Imagine what happens if you charge up somebody's vehicle with $100 worth of refrigerant, which is one pound of refrigerant, and they, you didn't quite get the leak fixed, and that $100 worth of refrigerant goes away and it, the car comes back, who's going to pay for that $100 worth of refrigerant? I mean, I mean if they care if they say, well, if you'd have fixed the leak, I wouldn't have, you know, see where I'm going with that. All right, they put a snazzy convertible here. Came to us with three primary concerns. We tackled a malfunction indicator light for, for, well, first, and it had a PO128 code. Now, who knows what a PO128 code is? You can read, right? What's a PO128? What's the separate? What's the similarity between a PO128 and a PO125? Now, the, typically, the, both of them point to the thermostat. Typically, uh, running a little bit too cold. A PO128 is basically means that it's running a little too cold. In my experience, a PO125 means it's running really cold. But on a Toyota, a PO125 doesn't mean the thermostat. It can mean the oxygen sensor. So keep that in mind. If you see a PO125 code on a Toyota, you may be looking at an oxygen sensor problem because it can't get warm enough to go into closed loop because the oxygen sensor heater is not working or whatever. I ran into that recently on one that smacked everybody around. But it turned out that, it, that that's what it was. Uh, it was. In other words, it was oxygen sensor, not the thermostat on it. Toyota Camry, older one, but anyway. Uh, put a nice hot replacement thermostat. It warmed it up and neutralized the mill. We took care of that. But two of the coal running vehicles we did during the past couple of weeks was when I wrote this, throw PO128 codes, it took us right to the thermostat. Now we've got this Ranger out here that we're struggling with right now. And now we pulled the... Uh, heater uh, hose is off of the heater core and we looped it out with a clear piece of hose. Now this, this Ranger's had three water pumps put on it and several thermostats and all that kind of thing and it's, it's, it's bone cold inside there. There's no coolant flow through that heater core. I mean we actually unhooked it. In other words we took the heater core out of the loop by putting this piece of hose on it. We unhooked the uh, heater core you know so that the one coming from the water pump that should be pumping water through there, uh, put it in a pan just to see what it would do. Now, it's, granted, it's going to empty the cooling system pretty quick, but one way or another, we uh, fired it up and it wouldn't put any coolant at all through that heater core. We revved it up a little bit and it trickled just a little bit out of there. Now, this is not a stopped up heater core because we've looped it out. This is when he put the head gaskets on there. And that's a crazy thing because we've got a new water pump. This little housing is new. There's something somewhere that's clogged up, but I'm, it has to be on the water pump side of it, not on the side where it comes back. Probably should have done that before we put a head gasket on. Yeah. Well, the head gasket was fun, though, and you enjoyed it, right? Why don't you try blowing a head gasket? Well, we can, but at the same time, you got to also remember the other issue with this truck. The engine is running too cold. If the water pump wasn't moving cool, but you'd expect it to run too hot, wouldn't you? And I have seen one that when it would idle would run at 200 degrees, but when you try to drive off, it would run really hot, really fast. But that was a, the impeller had come off the water pump because it had rusted off of there. Uh, but anyway, uh, besides the emissions factor, though, a coal running engine is going to eventually ruin itself because it builds up sludge 
and sulfuric acid production in the crankcase hole, not to mention lost fuel economy from running an open loop, the PCM ignores the open two sensors. You know, the PCM wants a good hot engine. You ought to be running about 210, basically what you're looking for. Now, I can remember a time when whenever we had a thermostat problem, it was always stuck shut, and it was making them overheat. You will not hardly ever anymore see a thermostat stick closed. Typically, they stick open, they fail the other way, they make it run too cold. I don't know what they changed, but I do know that in the 1970s, when I was working at that filling station, every time we turned around, one was running too hot. The thermostat, a lot of the time, was what was wrong with it. And it can still be that, but it won't be that most of the time. They caused it that so it would <clears throat> fail on the open side. Yeah, I don't know how in the world they would make that happen. But anyway, the next order on the dive was to diagnose the HVAC system. It seemed to cool tolerably well. But on the morning we were checking it, the ambient temperature was running at about 70. Now here's the point. If it's already cool outside, or if it's in the evening and the sun's not up, you may get into the car and turn on the air conditioner and say, well, this feels like it's just fine. But whenever you get into it when it's really hot weather, it won't cool you off. So basically you're wanting that. And some air conditioners work better than others. Uh, you know, the one on my Taurus that I used to drive, I drove a 95 Taurus for a long time. And uh, that thing would pull the air down to 38 degrees. It didn't matter how hot it was outside. It was just freezing cold in there. The Jeep Cherokee I had was lackluster. It did not cool me like I wanted to be cooled. Uh, but one way or another, not every system is the same anyway. Uh, but here we were. We identified the refrigerant as 100% R134A. And then we connected the, the gauges to find the pressures were low across the board, pulling the negative into the low side and running about 130 uh, on the high side. Whenever both of them are low like that, you're typically looking at an expansion valve or a clogged orifice or something. And if your orifice is clogged, you're going to have to do some detective work to figure out what clogged it and where it came from. So, on this particular one though, and I just sort of bounced across this, static readings aren't that reliable. When you first put your gauges up, you may see between 70 and 100 pounds. That doesn't mean it's got as much refrigerant as it needs. You can see really good static pressures and have lousy cooling system performance because of low refrigerant. This one here, uh, whenever what we do, whenever it's cool outside, what I like to do is I like to crank it up and I like to heat the under hood up really, really hot to where everything's too hot to touch and then recover the refrigerant. Now you don't do this with the air conditioner on obviously, but if you've got a good hot engine compartment, when you recover the refrigerant, you'll get it all out of there. If not, even though the thing goes down into the negative, when you walk away after it says it's done, it'll squeeze, it'll go back up and you've got to recover it two or three times to get it all out of there. I did that on my own Jeep one time and wound up getting two pounds out of it because I had actually just done one recovery a couple of times, you know, over the period of the last couple of years. And I wound up, I had two pounds in a pound, one and a quarter pound system. Too much refrigerant is not going to cool good either. And your high pressure cutout is going to kick the compressor off and on all that. So be aware of what that's about. Well, you know, we had no problem on this one. That, that was another story that I'm not going to cover. Next, we checked the exhaust smell. They had an exhaust smell. It was burning their eyes and all this. And the exhaust system from the catalyst back was sound. The flexible coupling that handles torque angle changes between the engine and the exhaust. I ran the exhaust manifold out on the header pipe and it was busted. So basically it was leaking exhaust right around there. Nowadays we would use the smoke machine for that to see where it's at. Uh, but all front wheel drive vehicles have some kind of a flexible joint because the engine tries to do this right here. And you got to have some, you might say it's got this joint that has a sort of a woven look to it. Like that right there. Uh, this one here, though, didn't look exactly like that. It was actually a part of the converter, and it was all but coming apart. So that wasn't visibly apparent unless you got up in there and got to looking at it while it was running or whatever. But you could rock it, and it was ragged and worn out. Uh, we actually got a, a catalyst, and we put it on there. So under $300, we did a little torch work to make it work, and it passed the test drive, and everything was fine. Well, there was a Pontiac Montana. They had an illuminated mill, and beyond that, an HVAC blower that would sometimes just quit blowing, and that's just really nasty. And the owner found out somehow she could slap the silencer panel under there, and the thing would start uh, would wake up and blow. So what's probably going to be wrong with that? Bad right. fan. Hmm? The fan's bad. It's got bad brushes in it. Or? Well, what is she slapping? Yeah, you're sort of, you're bouncing around. All right, you see this right here? That's off a Chevrolet pickup truck. 
and there's a lot of current that flows through that. And you might notice that this got cooked to the point to where uh, it's just all destroyed up in there. And whenever this thing starts to heat up and uh, snowball, the oxidation happens on those terminals and the current quits flowing and everything starts to get really, really hot. That's what happened on that one right there. Blue we had resistor. to cut, yeah, the blower resistor. We had to cut that off, replace the connector and the resistor. And they do, you know, whenever the connectors fail a lot, usually the parts house will have one you can get. But that was a blower problem on that uh, on that Chevrolet pickup truck, the 2006 model. But I mean, we see this kind of. There was a Pontiac Montana one. I mean, excuse me, an Oldsmobile Silhouette one time that we were working on it. And the blower motor wouldn't work on it in the uh, a high speed uh, blower relay had melted like that, and that was basically what it took on that. But anyway, she'd get it to blow for a while like that. We had another one, a Volvo, that had a uh, problem with the uh, blower motor, and I actually did the test on that Volvo blower motor where you turned it through and watched the light, and I saw it go dark. Sometimes the blower motor wouldn't work. It was a $110 blower motor for that Volvo. Um, all right, so I gave the thermostat replacement on that uh, uh, Pontiac, which is the 3.4 to this boy named Jesse, and he wound up saying he had to, hey, it looks like you got to have the exhaust pulled off. No, not really. It's kind of in there behind that crossover tube that goes behind there, but you can sneak that thing out of there if you've done a few of those. Uh, but anyway, that was really something. So, you can uh, leave it in place while removing the thermostat, visual evidence notwithstanding, and the lower housing bolt is a slot rather than a hole, and that's really nice because you just loosen it up and pull it right off of there on some of the newer ones. I will tell you something that I thought that was really weird though. There was a, uh, back in the, the, the quad four, how many of you know what a quad four engine is? You know what a quad four engine is? Anybody know what a quad four engine is? You know the one that when you open it up you don't even see any spark plug wires? It's just sort of like round on the top and it's like General Motors cars had them in them for a long time. And uh, it's a, I can probably pull up a picture of it. But it's got a little coil all of the, the coils are all mounted under this aluminum clever on top of the engine. Anyway, the water pump is driven by the timing chain on that one. And in the early 90s, whenever they had those engines, they actually had the water pump where you could unbolt the bolts and you could pull it out of the pulley, which was riding in a jack shaft bearing sort of, you know. And they pull it out, excuse me, out of the, uh, the gear uh, on the back, back there behind the engine. You could just unbolt it and pull it out of there and put another water pump back in. It'd take you about 20 minutes to change your water pump on that thing. You didn't even have to take a belt off. It was really, really, really handy. But then, as time went on, for some strange reason, they decided that they wanted to make it a lot harder, and so they started making it where you had to take the front off and pull the timing chain off of it to change the water pump. Now, these Dodge uh, Stratuses are like that, too. That 2.7 that's in this little car that Harley just got through doing the inspection on and everything, you had to just about pull the motor out of one of those things and put a water pump in it. It's driven by the timing chain in there. It's really aggravating, hard to get to. And there ain't no room between that motor and the shock tower to get that thing changed out. But uh, anyway, here's where we, what we ran into on this one, though. The aftermarket gasket turned out to be too fat to fit in the machine then set when installed on the thermostat. That's what it looked like. You work, 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 work. Never could get that to work. You can put some of that yellow gorilla snot on it to try to get it to stay on there. And whenever we ordered the... Uh, the right gasket from GM, it had a totally different look to it. And it went in there painlessly. Well, sometimes if you're working with aftermarket stuff and you've got something as simple as a gasket that's beating you up, well, think about this oxygen sensor we're fooling with on this truck of jeans out here. Uh, I've got like, uh, when I hooked it up to see how much current, well, we put it in there and the IDS was telling us it was only pulling a little less than an amp on that one and the one behind the catalytic converter is pulling two point five amps or something like that, two point three, and we're getting a heater fault on that. And when I hooked it up, the heater is the two wires that are the same color and I hooked it up with a meter in between there. It wasn't hardly pulling any current at all and the sensor didn't get hot. Well we got a different brand and when we hooked it up it got hot and it was pulling more current. We'll see how that works when we start it up this afternoon. Um, anyway, uh, now this is where the thermostat goes on the Sebring. Uh, and this was a different one than the one I just showed you the picture of. Now this is a really tricky deal here. What happened on this, this guy that was working on this thing, he came and he says, I can't get this thermostat to tighten up. He says the threads are wiped out in one of these holes down here. And on that particular one, you got to pull the air conditioner compressor off in order to get to the thermostat, you know, bolts. 
and the thermostat's down there between the air conditioner and the, you know, on the side of the that aluminum engine block. And so I said, well, get a, a, a six millimeter uh, tap and see if you can fix it. Well, he was screwing a six millimeter tap up in there and trying to work around the compressor instead of pulling it off. He breaks the tap off in the block. Broke it off, I mean, broke it off flush. I don't know how he did that. But now think about this. This is a 2004 model Sebring that's a really nice car. It's got an aluminum block and it's non-negotiable. You cannot put it back out there with one bolt hole in the thermostat on it. And you broke off the tap. You're going to ruin it. You're going to ruin the motor. Huh? You're going to ruin the motor. Yeah. Well, sounds like it. But how would you get that? How do you get that piece of a tap out of there? Where you out. Huh? Yeah, that's what I say, maybe. It was in there nice and tough. Uh, oh, there was yeah, not any like worries. Pretty it, tough, ain't it? Huh? And taps. Yeah, yeah, taps, you can't even scratch it with a drill bit. Now, there is a thing called a, uh, I, got, I saw that thing at the trade show when I was up there that will, it's a thing that you can put in a drill that will cut through anything. I mean, it'll cut through an easy out, it'll cut through a tap. It'll cut through a drill bit. It'll just, just make Shiny. short work. Can you tap up the tip of it? Huh? Can you tap up the tip of it with like that? I mean, like put some oil and then try to like... Sort of, but six millimeters is tiny. That's the size bolt you turn out with a 10 millimeter wrench. This thing is very small. It's smaller than a quarter of an inch. Okay, so tell me what we're going to do here. I mean, it's smaller than an actual... I'd say maybe you try to heat it up or something. Big up <laughs> it's aluminum, man. <laughs> you got to be careful with that. JB Weld. We got it out of there. And what we did was, we got, you know how that thing's fluted on four sides? You know, it's got a little thing. We got a little 1 8 drill bit and we punched it on each. You know, we found it that would fit perfectly and we drilled all four of them out and then we turned it a quarter of a turn and it came right out of there. And then we made that hole bigger and put a helicoil in it. And it's still running today, you know, because I know what the car is. Anyway, they haven't any more trouble with that. Now, that was really, really tricky because, like I say, here you've got a really expensive car, and all of a sudden it's down for the count. If you don't fix this thing right, if you make a bad decision and you go off in the wrong direction, next thing you know, they need an engine block or they need an engine. Or, and it's because of a dead gum thermostat. You know what I mean? you gotta, you got to make wise choices when it comes time to fix something like that, or you're going to be in hot water. Um, all right, now the lower radiator hose connects to the thermostat housing, but contrary to the shop manual, there's no air bleed on this housing, you know. Uh, the air bleeds next to the engine coolant sensor where the upper radiator hose connects right in the center of the passenger head. And that's what this thing looks like down there on the bottom, see. Now, actually, there was three bolts, not just, you, but whatever happened, it was this, this one down here is the one that, that twisted out, you know. And we wound up having to put the helicoil in that one right there, and I just wanted to clarify that. Yeah, there's a nice picture of the helicoil we put in there, and it worked out just fine. Uh, the engine was warm, the metal coat was gone, but the blower was still an issue, and in that case we found the blower connector had suffered heat damage due to oxidation and resistance on one of its cavities, and we took care of the blower problem on that. I think this is a slide that's out of order. That's the one for the Pontiac. Uh, but the Sebring's coolant jump gauge always started on cold and increased as the engine warmed up to you read either right above or right below the middle line and that is a very uh, this little piece of plastic is supposed to tell us if our engine's running too hot or not. I'm going to tell you something I've seen before. I have seen some of these Chrysler vehicles that would be reading right in the middle of the gauge like it was supposed to be but overheating and just I mean because of a bad thermostat or whatever and sometimes if you've got one that's making air now, you know what it does when it makes air? It just pushes a bunch of coolant out of the, uh, you know, you, you swear it's got a blown head gasket. Don't ever condemn a head gasket until you've checked the thermostat because even if it's trying to make air and overheat and it's not reading warm, put a thermostat in it before you do anything else so you don't look like a fool. Uh, but anyway, uh, I never let it get warmer than 240. You know, the needle should have moved farther toward the H range than it did right there. I'm watching the scan tool too, see. But look at this. The coolant temp signal on this 0427 is monitored by the PCM. See that? All right, and it forwards the signal to the instrument cluster computer via the PCI bus. And that's a lot of hardware and wire to drive a gauge that used to be hardwired into a simple thermistor. 
and the PCM also drives a high and low speed fan rate. So the PCM decides when to turn on the fan. It also reads this, you know, and it talks to the body control module, and the body control module, and then talks to this darn thing up here, and then you wind up with your coolant temperature gauge control right here. Well, this is not as simple as you would think it would be. All right. By the way, you're supposed to be taking notes. Everybody knows that by now. Uh, blower and coolant fan circuits have always been current intensive, though with the exception of the start and charging circuits. Nothing on a vehicle is more prone to resistance or heat damage than that. Okay. Now, when we realized the fans weren't operating, Andrew checked the common terminal for each fan relay, and was using 40 amp input, and found the terminals were just as dead as they could be. So basically, he was checking this terminal right here, the common terminal on these two relays. There was no power here. Feeding these, so the fan is not going to come on. Now you can also go right here and check and turn that fan through and see if that light goes off like I'm always talking about and do the same thing over here. We didn't need to do that at this point because we had no power going here. The fuse wasn't blown, but the problem we did find was almost as serious. The leg of the fuse had developed resistance, built heat, like the fan connector I was talking about, and that is really fairly common. And this is what it looked like right there when we pulled it out of there. That wasn't a blown fuse. You could look at it without pulling it out. You wouldn't think it was a problem. But the problem was that it was pulling so much current, it started to oxidize, it started to get resistance, it made heat, and so on and so forth. I had one Chrysler instructor try to tell a class of 12 mechanics that resistance doesn't make heat. What's wrong with that? There's a Greek word for that, hogwash. It makes heat. And I was the only one that would take him on. And finally he backed off and said, well, I guess it's why do they make ceramic resistors? Because they're going to get really, really hot. And ceramic's the only thing that can take the heat, you know? I don't know what that, where that guy was coming from. But anyway, uh, so the shorted fan will generally blow the fuse rather than simply open. And I've seen that. I've seen the fan with the wind is burned up in there, pulling like 60 amps and all, popping the fuse and all. You know, if you put the fuse in there, it goes pop, you know, you probably got issues with that fan. Sometimes that thing will be burned up and stinking and smoking, but it'll still run and all that. Now, on the late 1980s Ford van, some of them, we actually wound up with a situation that was sort of a, where the things would start melting the fuse. It would not blow the fuse, it would just melt it. And the fix that Ford sent down was to clip those two wires out of the fuse panel, put eyelets on them, and put one of those, re those circuit breakers in there, you know, a 30 amp circuit breaker in there, and that prevented that. The plastic would just melt, it wouldn't blow the fuse, you know. And uh, so that was basically talking about the same car at the bottom of that. Uh, that bleeder takes a 3.8, or, or 3, 3.8, ha oh, funny, 3 8 wrench, maybe 10 millimeter, and throwing the coolant system with it open allows the air to escape the engine block. That's what you're supposed to do, is open this up when you're putting it in there. You know, but if you think there's air trapped in there with it running, you can loosen that and it'll blow out like that right there. But that's not really what it's there for. It's there you're supposed to just lose it and fill it up. Now, I'm also going to give you a caveat on this. That housing likes to bust on these cars and leak coolant. And it will run out down the valley and it will drip out from between the engine and the transmission and all down on the back because there's a hole back there in the back of that valley. And you'll swear you got a freeze plug in the back of that motor when it's actually this housing will fill that valley up and it'll run down all over the transmission and everything. So be really careful to make sure that you know on these 2.7s that housing will come with a coolant sensor and costs about $50. They sell them at the parts house. Also, if that bleeder screw won't come loose, you can buy one and put it on there. I mean, I would be able to justify myself putting one of those housings on because you can't turn that bleeder. And nine times out of ten, that bleeder's locked up and you can't turn it. So be aware of that too. Uh, now, if certain something's rotten going on, uh, when the dash temp gauge is reading in the middle of the scan tool, it says cool, it's 240, and you get 192 on the upper hose and 83 on the lower one. And the thermostat feeds the lower hose, and this Chinese-made replacement thermostat we put in there the first time just wasn't allowing the coolant to flow. Now, the lower hose on this one is the thermostat. What's good about having the, the thermostat on the bottom instead of the top? It's not, well, it, when you pour the coolant in it, the air can get out of there easier because you don't have anything blocking it in the top part. Yeah, that's what I like about that. Anyway, we had a stuck thermostat because we had 192 on the top hose where the thermostat was not and 83 degrees on the bottom one when it was supposed to be open. And we had 240 showing on that thing. 
the fan is kicked on. After we replaced it, run constant. Here's another thing: when you're putting the, uh, you got you know done some work on the thing because it was overheating. If you want to make sure that everything's like it ought to be, don't have the air conditioner on so the condenser fans run. Let it warm up until they kick on by themselves. When they kick on, the coolant should get cooler and it should go back and forth with the fans kicking on and off. If it stays, if the fan stays on and the coolant gets hotter and hotter, you got a problem. Something's hot, something's rotten in Denmark. You need to figure out what's going on. And that's what was happening here. We basically had a thermostat we put in there that wasn't any good and was stuck closed, which is kind of unusual. All right, so finally, we just got a couple more slides left. We're almost done. Uh, vehicle number three was a 97 Honda Civic with lackluster AC performance and the heat related problem, AC and engine cooling. Uh, make it a good summer. Well, anyway, Rachel built this for me this morning and I shuffled some slides around, so excuse me if the words don't work right. We found a blend of 134 and R12 in that one. Do y'all do that over there? Do you, do you check it with an identifier? We do. Okay, so you, you better do that. Had to be pumped out into a gray and yellow ga junk gas bottle, which I got over there. We'll do that. All right, next we found we refill the system with a good clean charge, and we found out the head pressure was shoving the high pressure to uh, 400 psi, causing the AC clutch to go quickly, 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 kicking in and out because the pressure was so high. Uh, <clears throat> now, uh, typically what happens if it, uh, on this one here, because it's got a high pressure cutout switch, you do doing that. On some of the ones without a high pressure cutout switch, it'll blow the pop off valve on the air conditioner. You'll hear a big noise, see some steam coming from under the hood or something, and that's what happens on that. But uh, and all these AC compressors have a pop off valve on them. They all got it on there. Uh, rather like the Stratus, the condenser fan had melted its fuse. Somebody did installed a 30 amp in place of a 20. What's wrong with that picture? It's still going to blow the fuse even if you put a 30 where a 20 was, if it was blowing the fuse because something was wrong there. But anyway, this one here had melted the fuse, and we found the fan open electrically and inoperative, and Honda put those little mini fuses pulling the blower. Who in the world is going to put a teeny tiny mini fuse in there pulling something? Fuse. I don't like that. I mean, because you need to have more, you need to have more blade uh, size than that on that. But it's, it's surprising that more of them don't melt with a little bitty fuse pulling it. You know, it's sort of like you've got it on the ragged edge of not being good enough. Uh, so. Find the system, fix the problem. This is the last slide. Driver controls and PCM. Whenever the driver turns on the air conditioner, I want it to get these cars, what happens? It always on. The PCM knows you turned it on, typically. This is a typical thing. This is not on any one car. Usually the PCM and or the BCM or the HVAC controller, remember what, or programmer, it, wants to, it finds out that you turned it on. That is an AC request signal, right? Okay, you got your electrical system, your wires, connectors, and your blower. They actually are going to be part of the loop too because they actually have to be dependent on to carry these loads. This is a signal. The PCM energizes the relay. The relay pulls the fins. And the relay does the heavy lifting, you know, on the secondary side of the terminal. All right, you got refrigerant and compressor and heat exchangers, but there's a sort of a triangular thing working here. The coolant fans. I had a, in closing, I had a Ford Aerostar one time that they said the air conditioner would cycle off for five minutes, and then it would cycle back on. And it always did this very consistently. And there was no OBD2 then. This was OBD1. And we didn't have any serial data on that one. I had to figure out what was wrong and fix it. And you know what the problem was on that one? And it was something you don't even find in any of the books. The coolant temperature gauge was reading a little bit higher than what was true. And so what it would do, and like I say, nothing even told you this was something it would do. I noticed that when it, the engine coolant gauge would get up to where it was above a certain temperature, this is the one feeding the PCM, it would kick that compressor off until it got down to a certain voltage and kick it back on. When I changed the coolant sensor, it never cycled off like that again. But that was one of the things I kind of had to figure it out because it wasn't in print anywhere. And in my little book, I wrote that, you know, if you see the coolant temperature gauge above a certain temperature, it'll drop the compressor out to try to save it. You know what I mean? That's what was going on in that one. Okay, so tell me something you learned. What are you thinking about? Overarching, overall, the overall view that you get from this thing here. Cars and stuff still do that now. I don't know like if, it's, if it's running too hot, it'll cut everything out of it that you don't need, like AC and stuff. It does that. It'll drop the AC out of it. It'll also make, run the uh, 
richer, you know, or riching it up. And basically it turns that up. So why do we want to make it richer whenever it's running hot? Richer 